Good morning, everyone, and welcome to week two of virtual online classes. I hope that week one went smoothly. I hope that the uh, open book virtual midterm, uh, you felt prepared for it and was fair uh, to you. I will hopefully get those graded as soon as possible. Um, I, and, and my goal is to get them, the grades back to you within uh, two weeks or so. Um, but I will update you when I get those graded. I will upload basically my grades and comments uh, to as, a, as Word documents to the files uh, to the assignment section on Moodle so you can see your grade and you can see like where you lost points for each of the four questions and some of my general comments on each of the question. Um, so that will be forthcoming. Uh, this week uh, we're going to be talking about power and influence. Um, this infamous when we get to the week on power, this will, we'll be able to talk about this in more detail. Um, that, you know, obviously on re reflection should have put this uh, the topic for today earlier in the syllabus, but uh, this is a learning experience for all of us. Um, so today we're going to introduce uh, a, a theoretical way of thinking about power as having three faces. And this uh, was introduced in the reading uh, by John Gabetta. Um, and our goal is today is to define and describe the three faces of power as they're described in Gaventa's chapter, and begin to start thinking about how this framework of thinking about power can help us explain and better understand political outcomes and political decisions, or non-decisions, as uh, Gaventa will emphasize. So again, this week, we're interesting. We're interested in like what actually drives political outcomes. How do what drives people's decision making? How do people influence political outcomes in their favor? Right. If we remember our principles of political analysis, we've kind of, we've talked about rational self-interest and collective action problems. We've talked about how institutions coordinate behavior. We've talked about history, both. Um, uh, uh, institutional memory and history and just like past decisions frame future decisions. Um, but we haven't really talked about power uh, and we haven't or at least we haven't talked about power in a very systematic sense. Um, and so remember power is both an input that both contributes to political decisions, people influencing political outcomes, uh, but it's also a power is an output and this will become more clear and explicit towards the end of today's mini lecture. So in his 1980 book, Power and Powerlessness, uh, Gaventa's research question, if you will, is why don't oppressed groups rebel? Why do they appear to accept or consent to their own oppression? Like, why do we see massive amounts of inequality and oppression and domination in the world, um, but we don't always see rebellions, resistance, uprisings? And yet other places, and, other, and yet at the same time, this isn't a universal claim, um, there are plenty of cases of rebellions, uprises, resistance to inequalities in power. So what explains the difference between when groups rebel and resist and when groups do not? And so he says, in, his argument is that in order to understand this question, and we're not going to get to his full answer, uh, we're focused just on his typology of power, that we need a, need a more nuanced conception of power, that we can't just think of power as influence or coercion or resources, um, that we need to think of power operating in multiple different dimensions. And in this view, power has three faces or three dimensions. The first face is the ability to influence a decision. He calls it decisional power. It's also known as like the pluralist view of power. Um, I'll explain all of these in more detail in just a second. The second phase he calls non-decisional power. Um, and this is the power not to influence a decision, but to prevent a decision from even arising. This is also known as institutional power. And the third phase he calls ideological power. And this is a more sociological form of power in which um, the dominant group is able to shape the interests and values and opinions of the dominated group so that they have no desire to resist at all. So three phases of power, and we're going to talk, I'm going to talk first on how these three phases of power kind of are, how, we, how Gaventa defines and explains them. And then I'm going to talk about how these are actually, the mechanisms that these actually exist in, 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 in the real world. Now, Gaventa's reading uh, is fairly dense and fairly complex, so if you don't get all of it, that's not the end of the world. I'm going to kind of distill the important parts of the reading in this mini lecture. 
So let's start with the first face of power, and we can imagine two agent, two people, uh, two individuals, A and B. And right now, B wants, it has a preference for option X. We can imagine this is anything from a particular policy decision to something more, um, more personal, like they want to see movie X instead of movie Y. Um, however, the first face of power exists when A influences B's behavior such that B pursues option Y against their original interest. And the quick and easy definition of this uh, form of power is A has power over B to the extent that they can get B to do something that B would not otherwise do. B would prefer option X, uh, but B ultimately pursues option Y. And so this is the kind of traditional form of power, trying to influence um, behavior to do something that an agent would otherwise not do. This is known as the pluralist conception of power. And some of the key ideas is that its focus is on individuals, one individual um, trying to influence another individual and trying to influence their behavior. The key outcome here is the behavior. They're, try they're not trying to change the person's mind, right? Um, B still would prefer option X. Uh, they're trying to just influence B to do what A wants them to do. It's simply trying to influence their behavior. And this is usually what we're talking about when we're talking about like decision-making influence, right? That you can think of the tr trying to influence one senator trying to influence another senator to vote in a different way, or one person trying to or one voter trying to convince another voter to vote in a different way. Um, and for for Gaventa, this is a pretty like standard definition of power, but it's insufficient in a few ways. Uh, he he argues firstly that this doesn't explain differences in rebellion and acceptance of inequalities. That this doesn't explain why in some cases oppressed groups rise up and challenge this inequality while in others they do not. Uh, it doesn't give us actually any sort of like analytical purchase. If it's simply inequalities of power are enough to influence B's action, what happens when they don't influence B's action? Uh, he also argues that it's limited in focus to individuals and behavior it means we can't see other ways that power operates, that we can't see other ways in which dominant groups build and maintain their domination. Um, in short, as opera, he writes on page eight, as operationalized within this view, the power of A is thought to affect the action of B, but it is not otherwise, it is not considered a factor relevant to why B does not act in a manner that B otherwise not, might were he not powerless relative to A. That in sh what he's saying, and if we translate this uh, into more normal English, is that this, this account of power doesn't tell us why uh, B does not act, right? Why it doesn't actually tell us why B prefers different options. It doesn't, pr it doesn't really give us a full and robust explanation of why B's behavior would be otherwise, that we need something more to flesh this out. And so he turns to uh, sociological writers on institutions um, to develop a second face of power. And here, again, we have two people, A and B. They have convergent, divergent, sorry, uh, different preferences, option Y and option X. Um, but rather than trying to influence B to accept option Y, um, the second face of power occurs when, base, when uh, A can exclude B from decision making or exclude B's interests or preferences from the decision making at all so that there isn't a problem in the first place. Uh, power, Gaventa writes on page nine, is exercised not just upon participants within decision making processes, but also towards the exclusion of certain participants and issues altogether. This occurs through what he calls the mobilization of bias um, and, it, and it affects and the idea here is it prevents certain issues from even arising. You can think of this as the power to set the agenda, um, the, the power to prevent an issue from even coming to fore to Congress, right? If you, in, in more practical terms, if you exclude certain voices from participating in the political process, their grievances, their issues, their concerns are never gonna be brought forward. And so he can kind of summarize apparent an action within the political process by deprived groups may be related to power, which in turn is revealed in non-participation and participation and non-participation upon issues and non-issues which arise or are prevented from arising in decision-making arenas. 
And this is why he calls it non-decisional power, because it's the prevent, it's the ability to prevent a decision from even having to be made. A doesn't have to force B to do anything. A just kind of locks the door and keeps B's interests out. So there's no decision that has to be made. Um, and so why is this second face of power insufficient? It doesn't give us an account of how conceptions of grievances themselves form. So how do people even how do we even get this divergence between option X and option Y here? How do these uh, different conceptions of what is a problem emerge? Additionally, um, that people he argues that people can normalize and internalize the status quo. So it's not even that people are excluded from the decision making process, but they never even recognize that there's a problem in the first place. And that's where he introduces this third face of power. That, um, and they, this is what he calls ideological power. We can think of this as cultural power. And here, again, A and B, different interests. But rather than either coercing or forcing uh, B to do something they wouldn't otherwise do, or excluding them from political participation, here is when A tries to influence B's perception of interests uh, through ideology, through culture, such that B actually changes their mind and prefers option Y. So they don't have to lock them out. They don't have to try to influence them, their decision making and behavior. They basically uh, socialize B so that B internalizes the dominant group's opinions and preferences. Or as Gaventa writes, not only might A exercise power over B by prevailing in the resolution of key issues or by preventing B from effectively raising those issues, but also by affecting B's conception of the issues altogether. Um, and this is why it's uh, called um, uh, ideological power. You can think of it as cultural power or it's sociological power. Um, but it's trying to affect how B conceives of the political world and how they conceive of their interests and priorities. It's, deter it's, it's, deter it's the power to determine what is important and shape people's sense of value. Um, it's the ability, it's, the, it's important in that it prevents conflict from even happening in the first place and maintaining that power in the first place. So how do these different faces of power work? What are the mechanisms of power? So we can kind of spell this out in more detail. So if we're looking at the first face of power, the obvious way that A can influence B's action or behavior is through coercion, right? Or the threat of coercion. If I want you to do something that you wouldn't otherwise do, I can threaten violence at you. I can, or I can, threaten, I, can, I can threaten to harm you in some way. I can threaten to take resources from you. Uh, I can th threaten your life or your well-being. But coer and whether I'm a government or whether I'm a private individual, right? Direct coercion is obviously a form. Um, but but Gaventa also broadens this out to that we should think of this as not just coercion, but more importantly as political resources, votes, jobs, influence that can be brought by political actors to the bargaining game, right? I can offer you a job and you can do something you wouldn't otherwise do. I can offer you a vote on another bill and that might change you, get you to change your mind. I might buy you out by giving you, um, by giving you special pay, uh, by pay, like I can just literally buy you out. Um, and so you might sell your store to a large multinational chain that you wouldn't otherwise do, but I have so many more resources that I can figure out what would make, what I need to do to influence you to do something that you don't want to do. How do I get you, again, from option X, which is what you want to do, to option Y, which is what I want you to do? And, um, and getting, you, getting you here is I want to figure out what is the, how, what kind of resources can I leverage to mo to get you to change your mind, or to do some, or not change your mind, but to change your behavior, not change your mind. You still don't want to agree with me. You still don't want to do what I want you to do, but you do it anyway because I've influenced you with my greater resources. And we can also think of coercion as a type of resource, right? If you have greater physical strength, whether purely bodily or you have a weapon, that is a resource that I don't have, right? And that you can use to influence me. The, the state's ability to, you know, imprison one person but to buy, if they break the law um, or to use deadly force, right, is a resource. So we want to think of resources fairly broadly here. Uh, but this should be pretty straightforward, right? I use my greater resources to, to influence you to do something that you don't want to do. So what are the mechanisms at work in this mobilization of bias, right? How do... 
uh, how does this actually work? How do we try, how do we exclude certain participants from decision-making arenas altogether? Here, uh, Gaventa describes the values, beliefs, rituals, and institutional procedures that syst operate systematically and consistently to the benefit of certain persons and groups at the expense of others. So these are forms of beliefs, these are institutional rules, uh, and these are structures, these are kind of uh, values and rituals that basically exclude certain people's voices from participation. And the key idea, sorry, the key idea here is, again, non-decision that you structure the institution so that certain questions don't even become issues to decide, right? These can be anything from when you have a, the uh, uh, restrictions on, on, on voter, voting, right? If you're looking at making it harder for people to register to vote and requiring more forms of official forms of state ID, um, having limited polling up polling places or having um, strict registration timetables, right? These are all make it harder for certain people to vote. And these can systematically, uh, these system, there's research that has found these systematically exclude, make it harder for more poor people to vote. And so what you're actually doing is excluding their interests and beliefs from decision making power. Um, and so that you are not really able to, so they are not even able to raise these issues. And so the agenda, the political agenda within formal decision making procedures is the dominant isn't able to um, bring up any of these problems, right? And so this is can be uh, institutional inaction or the unforeseen sum effect of incremental decisions, he writes on page 15. Um, but you can think of these as like the rules of the game or the institutional structures that, prior, that systematically prioritize one group at the expense and exclude another group. The most kind of striking forms of these are obviously Jim Crow laws and um, in the in in, uh, in in the United States, uh, the limited African Americans from their ability to vote, despite the kind of constitutional guarantees, um, and that was basically allowed a systematic discrimination against one group that limited their ability uh, to bring their issues and grievances to public decision making power. Hopefully that makes sense. If you have questions about this institutional form of power, this non decisional power, please let me know. Come to office hours or come to the discussion section, we'll talk about this in more detail. So let's look at this third dimension of power. And so how does A get B to agree with them? How do they actually change the mind of B? Um, and and Gavenda talks about the social myths, language and symbols, as well as the social construction of meanings and patterns. So it's not really about institutional rules that exclude people, but it's the kind of cultural milieu, the these kind of mythologies and political cultures and value systems and language and symbols and representations, the way that we as a society construct meaning to our daily life um, that influences us on a more subconscious level. So this can happen directly uh, through control of information, things like propaganda, um, things uh, um, or using specific language uh, to 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 in inculcate particular belief systems, right? So like all the effort that people give into political debates about like how should we frame these decisions, right? Whether you frame um, uh, the abortion debate in terms of like pro-life, pro-choice, or whether you frame it in terms of reproductive health care, right? These work to influence the way that people value these things. Um, and then it also can happen through socialization and education, right? The type of stories that we tell in our education systems, the way we narrate history that influences the way that we perceive and understand and make meaning in the world. Uh, but Gaventa also argues that this can happen in indirect forms. Um, and usually this happens not by like A trying to actually influence the cultural values themselves, but as B uh, internalizes after a series of political defeats and not getting their way, they begin to adapt their political preferences and values to the dominant group. 
uh, they become uh, that this that, or either they adapt their views to align with the dominant group so that they can you know participate in politics or they develop a and their sense of exclusion means that they kind of withdraw from pol politics altogether and never raise these issues Gaventa talks about this creating a culture of silence that for the powerlessness and repeated loss in the political arena means that people don't even conceive their valid that people don't conceive their grievances as grievances anymore this can create false consciousness, like in the Marxist account, or split consciousness, like uh, as developed by people like W.E.B. Du Bois and other critical race theorists, uh, where people are not able to articulate their interests against or outside the dominant conception of interest. So Gaventa suggests that these forms of power, these faces of power, are interrelated and accumulative. And this is the chart that he puts on page 21 of the reading. And so winning initial decisions, um, you able to win the first decision, right? Um, because you have superior resources. Maybe you have more voters aligned behind you, right? And you're able to get your policy passed, right? And then you have these, this initial decision allows um, that's the first phase of power, allows the dominant group to then start constructing barriers uh, to participation, right? Allows them to mobilize the second phase of power, to build institutions ways, to build non-decisional power, to exclude B from raising powers. And then this is going to influence and shape this kind of experience of loss and de defeat is going to lead B to internalize the dominant ideology and culture. Uh, this is through myths, control of information, and also the experience of loss, right? And so this initial um, victory can kind of lead to a snowballing of power of A over B while also increasing the sense of powerlessness, right? Their initial defeat then their inability to raise issues, and then that is going to lead to their susceptibility to this third face of power here, uh, where they, their sense of powerlessness, they're going to have uncritical consciousness. And all of this means that this is going to coalesce around um, B is going to appear quiescent, or they're going to appear to consent to their own domination or their own inequalities of power in this face, right? That these build on each other to mean to allow A to maintain their power. Now, Gaventa argues that these power relations, once such power relations are developed, their maintenance is self-propelled and attempts to their own alteration are inevitably difficult. But he does think that it is possible, but that just like the phases of power build on each other in establishing these inequalities and establishing power, to challenge these power relations, we actually have to go backwards. It starts with the formulation of issues and strategies that the, uh, the, the powerless group has to first overcome this third face of power. They have to recognize that they are actually being oppressed, that they have grievances, that they are have interests that are counter to the dominant interests. They have to formulate this sense of ideology here. Then they need to overcome and mobilize uh, against these barriers to action. They have to find ways to get their voices heard, whether through mass direct action and demonstration, protests, social movements. Uh, find some ways to get over these barriers of this bias that has been mobilized, right? They have to overcome these institutional barriers. And then once they get in the decision-making arena, once that their voices are being heard, they have to mobilize enough resources to fight their relative powerlessness and influence political change, right? So, th so they kind of overcome, uh, rebellion is going to kind of work in this reverse pattern. It's going to work this way. And power is going to function in this pattern. And so this is the kind of cycle that is going on. This is a much more sociologically rich conception of power than simply just like A, uh, inflicting power over B. So don't worry too much about the methodological considerations that, are, that he discusses in the mid -page, pages like 25 through 30. Um, you don't need to focus on how like political scientists or sociologists would recognize these different mechanisms of power. Um, but skip ahead to his example of colonial societies on page between pages 30 and 32. Um, and in here he kind of outlays this, right? With the direct dominant of the colonial power over the 
uh, over over the colonized, right, we have this first form of power, right? They are able to mobilize um, sufficient resources, whether those are military resources or economic in, in resources, to establish a colony over the indigenous uh, population and extract resources or take over or, or territory. Uh, from then, the colonial power then begins constructing barriers to uh, to participation. There are institutions and administrative organizations that systematically preserve their power. So they need to use rely less and less on coercive violence, um, but instead on this mobilization of bias. And this eventually culminates in what uh, thinkers like uh, Franz Fanon and others talk about as um, the colonial situation or colonial consciousness in which uh, and some of the colonized begin to internalize the ideology and the culture of the colonizer, begin to internalize their own oppression through the shapings of wants, values, roles, and beliefs. Um, and so we can kind of see that working out in, in, in that stark example. And what you're going to do in your discussion threads is kind of try to think of another example of where you can see these three faces of power working together. So next class, we're going to look at um, how we can use this first face of power to understand voting, elections, lobbying, like our normal forms of political participation. How are these effects, how are these demonstrating this first face of power in American political practice? So we're going to look at votings and elections from AG and also how interest groups try to lobby people, right? See these, this pluralist conception of power. So for your discussion thread, and as a reminder, by Friday, everyone has to post one 200 word response to any of the discussion threads this week. So it could be if this one, it could be next classes or it could be Fridays by Friday uh, at, at 11.59 p.m. And then by Sunday at 11.59 p.m., you have to reply to one of your peers posts with a 100 word reply. So the discussion post for today. Choose a political or historical event, decision, outcome, example uh, that is interesting to you. It can be anything that's interesting to you. It doesn't have to be something that we've discussed in this class. How does it illustrate the three faces of power? And what does Gaventa's framework help us understand about this example? Um, so that is it for today. Hopefully uh, that helped clarify the Gaventa reading and uh, and now that you have a more robust conception of power, hopefully we can then turn back to American politics with the rest of the week and think about how these different faces of power are operative in American politics. Uh, like, as always, if you have any questions if you, about the material or concerns about the, the course format, send me an email, drop into open office hours. Those are, again, from 1230 to 130, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They are open sessions, so there are going to be other people in there. If you need to schedule a private meeting, uh, send me an email and we'll, and we'll set that up. Uh, as always, stay safe and healthy, and I will see you next time. Take care.